background is as a trade union official for Unite. Um, she was elected in 2014 as Labour MEP for the South West and Gibraltar. Uh, if she had been elected at the previous election, she would have been one of my 751 bosses because I used to work for the European Parliament. Prior to her election, she had been the Labour candidate in Salisbury and she'd also worked for Gordon Brown at number 10. Um, as the European Parliament, she's a full member of the Parliament's Committee on Budgets, which is a committee of key importance. She's also a substitute member of the Committee on Industry and Research and the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. So basically, she knows what she's talking about. Claire supported the Remain campaign in the referendum. Uh, and I remember bumping into her one day when she was uh, doing some leafleting on the prom. And she's also argued against the triggering of Article 50. And in June last year, she called for Jeremy Corbyn to stand down as part of the 2016 Leadership Challenge. So, what's not to like? <laughs> <laughs> um, please don't be put off by the, the camera crews here. Um, this is absolute uh, essential. It's a police requirement. <laughs> <laughs> You'll all, be on some data yeah, you'll all be on some sort of database somewhere, I'm afraid. And if you think you can get a, a driving license, forget it. Um, but you haven't come here to hear me. I hope you've come to hear Claire. And she's now going to talk about, well, I assume the ghastly situation we're in now. Okay, go with Claire. Thanks so much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, thank you. I'm here to prove Rod wrong about being the most boring speaker in the evening. Uh, and thank you for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, yes, I have the enormous privilege of being the member of the European Parliament for the South West and Gibraltar, and Gibraltar will come up again later. Uh, and I was, of course, ecstatic to have been elected. The job exceeded my expectations, not least because of what could be achieved through the European Union for the people that are in the South West and Gibraltar. And, uh, and you know, my heart was broken last June when uh, the result came out as it did. Uh, and frankly, it hasn't really mended since. <laughs> you know, being here this week after Wednesday is, um, you know, I'm glad to be here and I am really glad that groups like this are popping up all over the region and all over the country because in my view, I'm not just broken hearted, I'm angry about where we are and why we are where we are and I do believe that we have to keep going with the fight and standing up for what we all still believe in. I may have lost last June, but it's a bit like elections. When you lose an election, you don't suddenly go, oh, I was, I was wrong all along and the other side were right. <laughs> I still firmly believe I was right all along and I will continue to stand up and to, uh, and to do that and to say that. Uh, it was interesting, I was obviously in the, uh, the Parliament on Wednesday when uh, the letter was sent through to Brussels. Uh, I'm part of what's called the Socialists and Democrats group in uh, the European Parliament, which is all our sister parties from across, uh, across the 27 other countries and ourselves. And just like in the run-up to the referendum, where I could not move for, you know, get into a lift without colleagues saying, how can we help you? How can we help you win the referendum? Uh, on Wednesday, we had a special group meeting about Article 50, and uh, Glenis Wilmot, who's our group lead, our uh, delegation, British delegation leader, spoke and got a standing ovation when she said, I am and you know, will remain a uh, European. Uh, and you know, the solidarity from our colleagues. And equally when uh, I spoke later on in the meeting uh, and uh, you know, talked about the, you know, a few issues, but equally you know, a round of applause from colleagues as well. And it is a demonstration that, you know, Nobody wanted us. It wasn't the other 27 that got us into this mess. <laughs> Quite the reverse. This is an entirely 
homegrown problem. And, you know, and the solution to it is we can't go, we want the other 27 to get us out of this mess, because they won't. You know, along with the warmth that I had from colleagues, there is now a kind of business-like approach from them. You know, they have the European Union to worry about, and they need it to continue in existence, as do we. And they are therefore working out how they respond to Theresa May's <coughs> government's letter <laughs> triggering the Article 50. Uh, and so whilst there is still that warmth, they you know, are now working out how they stand up and do what's right for the other 27 member states. And Wednesday also saw the point at which we lost our sovereignty. It's the point at which it became the EU 27 who take back control. <laughs> they are the ones that are now going to be running this process. They are the ones that are going to be determining our future and our economic future. And it is now us that are going to be sitting back and watching and waiting for what is going to be happening on the, uh, through, throughout these negotiations. And there is, the reason I said I'll be mentioning Gibraltar again is actually is a brilliant example of what happened <coughs> around Gibraltar this week as to what is going to happen through this process. The, the Gibraltar is part in the European Union because of its relationship to the UK. It is the UK government's responsibility to take care of the European citizens who live at Gibraltar. It's not anyone else's responsibility, it's the UK government's to do this. They, when they submitted the letter on Wednesday, did not put anything in that letter about Gibraltar. In fact, they actively, well not actively, I don't believe it was actively, but the wording of the letter explicitly excluded Gibraltar because it just talked about UK issues. And it only mentioned that the UK has one land border with the EU. <laughs> we have two. <laughs> this is a fundamental issue. <laughs> it's a fundamental responsibility of the government to get things right. And the reason that I mention that, not just because they're constituents, and yeah, I'm obviously you know, quite concerned for all my constituents, including <laughs> them, but the reason I mention it is that if they can't even get a fundamental constitutional point right yes. in the most important document a government has written for decades, what hope have we got <laughs> when they get to the detail around the yeah. Hundreds, and I am you know, possibly you know, actually genuinely thousands of regulations that are going to be up for negotiation in the coming years. And it frankly terrified me when I read that letter. And then this morning, we got the response from the Commission. Now, not surprisingly, Gibraltar voted 96% remain. They know the names of the people that voted leave. <laughs> <laughs> and this morning, we found out why. You know, <laughs> there was a demonstration of why. Because the EU27 now have to worry about the 27 countries that are the remainder of the EU, one of whom, and a, you know, a very important one, is Spain. Mm -hmm. And in their response this morning, the government forgot to mention Spain, uh, Gibraltar, sorry, Spain did not forget to get Gibraltar into the text and say there cannot be anything in that text without the Spanish government's agreement. So, you know, we, may, you know, we have a government that isn't paying attention to detail. We have 27 other member states and the Commission and all the institutions who are. And that is something that you know, we need to be very, very well aware of as well. So, you know, this is... Uh, you know, just why I think the government have got, you know, if they're going to get this right, they've got to do several things. One is step up on the detail. 
because actually this is going to be hugely important. But the other thing, which is also immediate and really, really important, is change the tone and the background and the way they are talking to our neighbourhood and the people that we will still have a close relationship with if we can't get ourselves out of this mess um, in the near future. I still think long term, uh, uh, <laughs> I can't believe the young people I speak to will want to stay out forever. But, uh, that's, uh, you know, these, but whatever happens in these negotiations, we have to still remember these are our friends. They are our neighbours. They are our allies. And we should not be doing what Theresa May has done. I don't know if it got survived the night. I hope to God it didn't. I didn't get a chance to look on Wednesday. But when I saw on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, sorry, I didn't get a chance to look on Thursday morning, when I saw the Sun front page that said, we will, you know, your money or your life was the front page. Really? That's our negotiating strategy? Yeah. <laughs> Don't charge us anything, and we won't. We, you know, we might share our security information with you. I mean, it was phenomenal. The idea that we would be suggesting that we would be turning our backs on our allies, let alone anything else, if they didn't do what we told them to do, is um, and that we would, it would even cross anyone's mind to put issues of security on the table as bargaining chips. I mean, it's bad enough they've been doing it with people for the last months. So the idea that they would do it with lives, literally lives, is um, mind-blowing. The, the, the consequences of the January speech of, you know, do as I say or we'll become a tax haven, <laughs> you know, the Hannon point, and then immediately jumping on a plane to go and hold hands with Donald, uh, with Donald Trump. Nearly said it, Tusk, that would have been a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and then go, I wish you was holding hands with Donald Tusk. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then fly and go and meet with Erdogan with everything that's going on with Turkey. So uh, it was another illustration of actually the words in the letter were, uh, <laughs> the words in the letter were quite. Um, Peacemaking in the sense of they were, they were more emollient than a lot of her words have been up to now. But it was another example of don't listen to the words, watch the actions. And it was the actions that, you know, the, the, the going to Trump and then going to Erdogan, it's the actions that is what people see, you know, take notice of. And, uh, and that's what concerns me. So uh, the now we've given Mover sovereignty, now we've given over control. It is also very, very clear that we are now, we're not at the start of a two year process. We've started a very, very long process. We have two years to sort the divorce out. We have two years to sort out what it is that um, is the settlement, the divorce settlement. Uh, and that's going to be crucial because when I say two years, that's not actually how much time we've got for the divorce settlement. <laughs> it's a lot less than that. Uh, we then, dear God, if this is all, if this process is all going to go through, we have then got to work out what the framework is for the transition, because there has to be a transition for the sake of our country, and then how we have a future relationship. Uh, because of the, the level of complexity, and I could go on for the rest of the evening about different aspects, whether it's our aerospace manufacturing, whether it is our isotopes for radiotherapy, which are governed by a separate treaty, the Euratom Treaty, which I can genuinely bore for Britain on, and, uh, or Europe, <laughs> or whether it's the regulations that cover our research or our satellite programs or you know, all of these things, all of these details, we will not get those done in two years if we are going to have any approximation of a connection in the way that we have a connection now. So the, 
the, the countdown begins now over the settlement. But I say now, you may or may not have noticed there's going to be, we had a Dutch election. It went better than we could have expected, frankly. I, mean, I, I had my, a little bit of faith restored that you know, perhaps 2017 is the year when we see sort of the balance being righted a bit in uh, global politics, because uh, to be honest, 2016 wasn't a great year for that. Uh, so we've, the Dutch election went okay, but we have got the French presidential election at the end of April and beginning of May, two-stage process. But people, you know, we're concentrating on that, and my God, I hope that goes okay for all of our sakes. Uh, but it's not just that. I mean, it looks like the way the polls are going at the moment, that Macron is, so he's an independent, and he's got his own group now called En Marche, but he's, uh, many of you probably know better than I do. Uh, but he's an independent, it looked like it would be a runoff in the final round between him and God help us the National Front candidate, and please can our mainstream, media, our mainstream media, our national media stop giving her airtime. She is a National Front candidate. You know, this is not any, uh, any normal politician. This is, you know, the Front National is somebody that we were trying to get off our streets in the 1980s. This should not be normalized in any way, this politics. But anyway, she will be, as the polls stand, in the runoff. The polls currently, she says grasping with, are looking like you know, the, the Le Pen cannot build enough support to win the presidential election. But a month later are the French parliament elections. And that's where we could see some real issues arise as well. Because again, you know, it's whether or not Macron has a political base. And there will certainly be an FN base in, uh, in the parliament, I'm afraid to say. So we've got the politics will change. One way or another, the politics will change in, uh, in France. So France is going to be uh, in, you know, in the kind of a, a different place. and going to be working that out over the summer, where they are. And we have the German elections. In, uh, in the autumn as well. So you know, that's going to take, and the, the Germans, again, looking at the polls, will almost certainly need to um, work, work through some kind of coalition after their elections, late, late September, I think it is. So that's going to take some time. So realistically, aside from, you know, the Italians may well have an election sometime soon. They're, they're, they have been known for having regular elections in the past. <laughs> so, uh, they, they may be about to do that again. Uh, and the, actually, on the current polling, there's a group called Cinque Stella, the Five Star Movement, who uh, will produce some interesting politics in Italy, and they are topping the polls right now. Um, after Renzi foolishly calls a referendum. Uh, as an aside, referendums are banned in Germany because they are recognized as being the tools of tyrants. Yeah. And you know, I, would, I would strongly advocate that as a future policy. Um, but we are where we are. Oh, we've had another one, by the way. So, yes, yeah, so we've got the German elections, which means the two-year countdown won't start until well into the autumn, because realistically, the other 27 governments are not going to um, uh, get the get a, a settled negotiating position. I mean, they will have a start of one in June. I think it's their uh, the, when they will come back after the statement that Tusk made uh, this morning, uh, or the statement that was put out from the council this morning. So we've. It's going to take a while for that all to settle down, <coughs> uh, for them to work through, and. The final agreement, if it is going to go through the EU processes and the legal scrubbing and all the rest of it, as well as the translations, and obviously it has to be agreed by the European Parliament, if it's got to go, it's happening like what happened over Gibraltar just this week. That's only what the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's going to happen. But if we're just critiquing as we're going along, we're not going to reach into the hearts and minds of the 52% that we have to reach into if we are going to change the nature of the debate. 
So we have to be ensuring that we are talking about our relationship with the European Union in terms of being part of a community. Part of a community in a global stage, a community that has brought us peace. A community that is our neighborhood and a community that we should be proud to belong to and proud to have been a leading part of. And that, I think, is where we start kicking off from for uh, the coming months to see what we can do about where we are and where we go from here as well. So thank you very much.